Welcome everyone to the first edition of Sustainable Development Goals Action Conclave 2020. Today in this session, we're going to be focusing on Sustainable Development Goal 5, that's gender equality, where we aim to achieve gender equality and also empower all women and girls. So before we begin this discussion, let me tell you a little bit about Youth Forum. So Youth Forum is a project under Alexis Society and our team majorly consists of inspired students and professionals who are solely interested in creating social impact by conducting research on policy issues, writing thought-provoking and insightful blogs, designing creative social campaigns, organizing life-changing events, and also interviewing leaders and change makers. So it's very aptly said that the youth are not only leaders of tomorrow, but also the partners of today. So we at Youth Forum are a team of creative and encouraging individuals with a shared mission. That's a mission to change the world. So through this first edition of the SDG Action Conclave, we wish to bring together the change makers and the leaders from all over the world under the Act for SDGs Campaign Week of the United Nations. This is certainly going to help us create an actionable agenda that will aid all of us in achieving the SDGs through all the initiatives and much more than that. So right now, we all know that the world leaders are virtually meeting at the United Nations General Assembly to discuss issues and to give solutions to these issues. So we are also trying to do our small bit by taking action and raising awareness and initiating a better discussion ahead. So we all know that the turning point of the planet and the people needs to be somewhere. We have to start somewhere. And this is where we need to start. We need to start right now. Now, I am very happy to announce that today we have two eminent personalities with us to discuss this issue. So first is Ms. Lara Stein, and she is the founder and CEO of BOMA Global. She also acted as the executive director of Women's March Global, where she managed the Women's March movement and chapters outside of the United States. Ms. Stein also acted as the interim executive director of MIT React, which is a new institute-wide organization as MIT, at MIT dedicated to developing a global educational platform for displaced populations and refugees. So she was also the managing director of Singularity University's global expansion and implementation strategy. And she currently sits on the board of Equality Now and La Leila, which is a non-profit dedicated to education through the arts in South Africa. Ms. Stein is also the founder and former director of TEDx and of the TED Prize, having overseen the strategy, creation, development and implementation of the TEDx program at TED. Now we have Mr. Kunal Mandal with us, who is the co-founder of Gyan Space, which is a gamification company which uses quizzes and other games as a tool for personal growth and people engagement. He is also associated with citybytesindia.com, which is a travel portal which helps travelers discover and book inspiring city experiences provided by local experts. Currently, he is on a mission to teach curiosity as a life skill and also it to increase awareness about sustainability and empower young Indians to be more than what they think they can be. So to take this discussion forward now, while trying to arrive at solutions through this session on SDG 5, I would like to hand over the conduct to Mr. Mandel. Thank you so much, Arju. And uh, a very warm welcome to each and every one of you who is joining in and listening today uh, for this session. And I have a very, very special guest today. And I have Lara Stein with me to discuss SDG5 and beyond. And uh, Lara, a very warm welcome. Thank you for uh, giving us time and being uh, here with us. Thank you for having me. Great. So let me begin with uh, probably the focus goal first, that is SDG 5. 
Uh, you are the executive director, uh, director of Women's March Global. Uh, it unites women worldwide to lead in their local mission to advance uh, women's uh, human rights. So tell us a little bit about it. What is it? What is the movement all about? And what are you trying to do through that to achieve SDG 5? So I'm, I'm, at the moment, um, I was for a, a year heading up. I am no longer am um, the head of Women's March Global. Um, but, you know, I can go back to sort of the evolution of, um, you know, my background, which is, um, you know, I've worked for a lot of large for-profit companies and run divisions inside for-profit companies. And um, as you so um, nicely introduced me, I've also built a series of different global movements. Um, I founded the TEDx movement at TED. I designed Singularity University's global expansion. And so if I go back and look at um, the evolution of my career, two, there have been two underlying um, drivers behind what, I, I, what, what really motivates me and what excites me. And one of them is education, because I feel deeply that many of the world's biggest problems stem from the fact of a lack of education. And this goes back to, I grew up in South Africa during apartheid, and I really saw how education, educational systems were used as a tool to, um, you know, put down um, the, the, the black population and um, perpetuate the system of apartheid. And so everything I've done throughout my life has been on, has had a backbone of education and the second piece of it is around gender equality and empowering women and empowering young and up and coming women and mentoring them. Because I truly believe that none of our organizations on the planet will be um, fair places until we have true representation of voice. But also that the majority of organizations, and you can look at a lot of corporations, who have been able to include some level of gender equality into their hiring practices actually are more successful organizations. And so I know, you know, from when I first stepped into the workforce to now we've come a long way, but we also have a really long way to go. And I feel the sense of urgency in how we get there and how we need to get there. Um, I stepped in to run Women's March for that one year, the global part of Women's March, because I had built big global platforms and communities at scale. And I felt my background in opening up and scaling communities would be useful to that movement. And my motivation for doing that was that I have two daughters. I have one daughter who just graduated high school. Um, and I have a 12 year old daughter. I also have a son, a, a, a son who just graduated. But I really want our world to be a more fair and equitable place for my girls as they move into the world and as they move into the workforce. And so a lot of what drives and motivates me is how do we design for a more human centered and fair world? And that includes, um, you know, women being at the table with men in every sense at, you know, whether it's the boardroom or, um, you know, an internship. And so my, my, my whole goal is to look at current structures around the world and think about how can we design them better for more inclusivity, more transparency, and, um, and you know, create a system that is fair, that's educating everybody. So representation of voice is one of the key takeaways I noticed that you mentioned. Now, uh, you know, you, you mentioned that you built uh, TEDx uh, as a community, and if I, uh, I think it, you developed it in 2009, and by 2013, you have uh, grown it into a global phenomenon with more than uh, 40,000 talks at more than 9,000 TEDx events in 1,200 cities across 133 countries. Now, if I'm not wrong, all of these were primarily volunteer-driven. So uh, tell, us a, tell us a little bit about what's your formula for how to build a massive volunteer network like this, and more importantly, how to sustain it long term or long enough for them to make uh, the right amount of impact? Yes, so I think, you know, since having departed TEDx, I've been asked by several, um, you know, major 
organizations, both for profit and non-profit, to help empower their community and grow their community. And I always come back to the fact that, um, you know, when you are empowering a community to really drive innovation and impact, you have there. There's a fine line between how much you control and how much you let go, and it's sort of a shifting line. And everybody involved in that organization from those sitting on the board all the way down through the organization need to be clear on how much you are really willing to open up and let go of your organization and your brand if you want to empower the crowd authentically to be a part of whatever you want to build and so you know in the case of tedx it was an evolution of saying of creating a, a group of at the time which was when we when I, when I was designing it was a series of guidelines um saying here are the guidelines um and if here's the free license you can you can use the ted brand if you agree to these few guidelines and um but there were definitely guidelines that were put in place to protect the brand. It wasn't completely open. So, for example, you could only host a TEDx event that was larger than 100 people if you had actually been to the TED conference, if you had attended the main TED conference, which for a lot of people, because of the price, was a barrier. And so if you look at it that way, it wasn't completely open. Um, and yet you know, 3,000 people a year manage to hold TEDx events and still manage to hold TEDx events around the world. Um, and so it was really by design, we created some perception of openness and yet some of it was the guidelines were very controlled. And yet over time, those guidelines evolved. And so by, you know, within six years, we had created different um, rules for different groups of people in different parts of the world, depending on how comfortable they were with adhering to guidelines and um, how the movement was growing in that part of the world. Um, with regards to, you know, the gender equality piece, um, growing TEDx um, was interesting. I think this is pretty um, um, tr traditional for any event or event organizers, including, you know, TED itself is that in order to create gender equality and have as many women speak on your stage as you have men, you generally have to ask more than three times as many women because women are more, much more likely to say no. And they say no for a lot of different reasons. Obviously they, you know, if they're bringing up their kids, it's their time. If they're balancing, um, you know, bringing up their kids, being a homemaker and a job, um, you know, the idea of um, you know, stepping up and, and, and creating a talk is more difficult because of the, t the time commitment. Um, and, you know, I think there's also women definitely suffer more from um, imposter syndrome, which, you know, I mean, I do. I often don't feel like I, you know, I do feel like an imposter, even though I've had some success in my life. I don't always feel like I deserve that success where guys are much more confident in their ability to say, of course, you know, I deserve this, I should give this talk, right? And so it's much more difficult to create um, represent, true um, diverse representation um, on the stages of any event based on, um, you know, certain factors. And I think that is something, as I've now gone into launching my new company, BOMA, we work very hard at how do we, BOMA is a decentralized network where I've taken what I've learned from building TEDx and building Singularity University and building Women's March to get back to your second question to create a more sustainable system where um, the for-profit products in our network ha help drive the impact work we want to see in the world. And so we're doing a lot of work with corporate training. Um, BOMA is a decentralized network of local partners that are driving how do we design a more um, intentional, intelligent future. And we're doing um, this predominantly through corporate training. We work with organizations on what they need to know and who they need to be in order to lead through this really complicated time and lead us into a future that is designed in a more fair and inclusive way. And while that is generating profit and revenue, we then use the, um, some of that to help fund the work we want to do, which is the bottom-up change in communities around the world and drive the impact. But as we're doing that, we always try to make sure that we um, go back and double-check and, and there are systems built in 
that we are looking at how to make it diverse, have gender equality, um, and create, create as much transparency as we can within this decentralized global network. Great, uh, thank you. And uh, you know, you mentioned uh, that uh, all of the learnings that you had from your previous experiences that you used to build, uh, you know, Boma into a more sustainable and decentralized network. And uh, you know, uh, interestingly, I was listening to one of your talks uh, on YouTube, which came up at Boma France, and it was really inspiring. And you happened to mention a story called uh, "The Gods Must Be Crazy." And, uh, you know, it, it, the, the part of it said something like, uh, the world isn't happening for us, but we are creating this world. And how, according to you, uh, you know, and you mentioned a Coke bottle moment that you had and, uh, you know, sort of uh, in the story and how, according to you, can we surpass that Coke bottle moment of getting ahead of negative consequences of uh, technology and other, other issues in order to bring about any kind of change? Do you think, uh, we might be falling prey to the negative consequences of the world that we have created. And uh, maybe that's what holds us back from bringing a global positive social change. I would love to know your uh, perspective and maybe a little bit of the story as well. Sure. I mean, we're living through very complicated times. Not only is everything speeding up, but you know, we're living through a global pandemic that has really highlighted all the cracks in our society. But I still am an optimist and I believe at the end of the day, we are in control of the future that we want to design. Sometimes it feels like it is completely out of our control. But yeah, I can go back and tell the story because I grew up in South Africa and it was one of my favorite stories growing up. Um, you know, I called my company Boma because in ancient Africa, the Boma was a enclosure made of wood. There was a circle where the tribe would, you know, come together to have meetings and take action. And so, um, it's this idea that we need these new emergent circles on the planet right now to design a, a better, more intelligent world for every inclusive world for everybody. And so the God must, must be crazy is a story we used to tell sitting around a campfire when I used to go on safari as a little kid to the bush. And um, it's a story of a bushman who is a, you know, walking in the, the, the um, Kalahari desert one day and this, glass Coke bottle falls on his head and he picks it up and it's the most beautiful, most shiny, most round thing he's ever seen. It's the most perfect thing. And he's like, this must be a symbol or a sign from God. And he takes it back to his village and he shares it with everybody. And it, and it becomes this tool. It's harder than anything they've ever had before. So they can crush the grain and they find all these amazing uses for this Coke bottle. But very soon, it creates um, a lot of jealousy and a lot of disturbing um, um, behavior and unintended consequences in the tribe because people are jealous of who's using it and how it's being used and they can't understand why the gods only sent them this one Coke bottle. And so soon there's a lot of um, social dynamics that this tribe had never expected, negative social dynamics. So the, um, the chief of the, the Bushman decides he's going to go and hide the Coke bottle. And so he makes a, he, he heads off one morning on his own and he digs a big hole and he buries the Coke bottle. And, um, and yet the presence of the Coke bottle is still felt for, because it's sitting just on the outskirts of their little, you know, their, their tribe. And so he has to go back, he digs it back up and he decides that this time he's gonna head out and he's gonna throw this gift from the God off the side of the world because it's brought too many bad, um, too many bad interactions and too many bad um, consequences to his tribe. So he heads off and he finds a cliff at the what he thinks is the edge of the world and he throws the Coke bottle off. And for me, it's sort of a symbol of, you know, we've been given these tools right now, these amazing tools of technology, and we have to figure out what we do with them and we have to figure out how we use them for good and how we try to figure out, you know, what the unintended consequences of these tools could be and how we design them to support and help us being better humans rather than the tools taking control of us and turning us into a different species of sorts. And so I think, you know, that story sort of represents a lovely um, metaphor of the moment we find ourselves in. And, um, you know, BOMA is definitely a decentralized network of partners that is set up to think about how do we um, use technology um, 
you know, scientific discoveries um, and all these different things that we're, we, we're inventing right now to design a better, more human, inclusive, more human-centered future. Yeah, I mean, that, that story is really, I, I found that story really, really inspirational. And, uh, you know, this time also when I hear it again, and it's, it's, it's really, I think everyone who is listening in, that story is going to stay with them for a long time. And also it tells us how you created BOMA and what the concept uh, came from. That was an interesting thing to know for us uh, as well. Now, um, you know, let me go slightly deeper into the goal uh, itself. Uh, there are a lot of organizations and initiatives that are working towards uh, achieving gender equality and bringing women to the status that should have been theirs by default. Uh, but what, according to you, is the most important factor to bring about this change? And uh, I will add one more question uh, along the way is, uh, you know, despite of these innumerable initiatives, gender equality still remains uh, sort of uh, the truth on paper, but seems to be far from reality. Uh, so what are your opinions on that? Yes, at the end of the day, I think like everything else, a lot of this comes down to just human will. I think we're at a time where we're seeing a real um, tension between, you know, old top-down, patriarchal driven systems and new agile decentralized inclusive systems and you feel the tension everywhere and everything we do whether it's our political systems our um, you know the way we we lead um, and so I think part of it is the will right there's no reason to have absolute equality right now um, it's 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 cultural and it's it's the will of those that are in control to do things differently um, you know, in my opinion, like with apartheid and affirmative action, some of this doesn't happen unless we um, create systems that, um, or, um, you know, sort of government um, takes control of creating some kind of systems that, that, that sort of help move, the, move and shift the dial a little bit. You know, I believe strongly that it, a lot of it is from the top down. If you look at a lot of American companies or Fortune 500 companies, there is still significant um, gender imbalance, especially um, in places like, you know, the, fin the financial sector, um, you know, and others. But none of that changes unless we put an equal amount of women on the board of these organizations. And so in order for the shift to happen, I believe we need sort of um, some affirmative action like they've done in the Nordic countries where they have quotas on boards and you have to have um, a certain percentage of women on your board. A lot of the research shows that just having one woman on a board that's tokenized or one person of color on a board does nothing because that person still feels very isolated and they're not empowered actually to truly represent their opinions and their ideas. So it's really, they're really tokenized. And then in order for there to be any meaningful um, diversity and, and, and ability to um, express your opinions, there has to be at least, um, at least a third of the board needs to be, um, you know, would have to be female. So, I don't think that happens anywhere just by, um, you know, by, by, by us saying, well, it would be nice to have. I think there have to be um, some systems put in place to actually ensure that that happens. And so I think that would be a first great step. I know in California, they have passed a law that um, requires, um, I think it's by... 2030 that x amount of um, women have to be represented on any given board and so i feel like in america more of that needs to happen you know in countries around the world where they're even further away from in, from women being any in any kind of seat of power um i 
I think that would be an imperative. Otherwise, I don't see how we ultimately get there. There should be, um, you know, more representation of women in government. There should be more representation of women in top positions within corporate organizations. And there should be more representation of women, you know, across the board. And that isn't just women who sit in positions like, you know, the marketing department or the communications department, which have often been the buckets where they've been able to get the, um, the numbers up. And so I think we have to be honest and transparent and understand this isn't going to happen and just by thinking it might happen, but really have put um, processes and laws in place that actually force it to happen. It's the same with apartheid. Would apartheid ever have ended in South Africa if it hadn't have been for um, sanctions? Um, you know, so there have to be triggers that help the system shift. Yeah, so rightly put. And since you mentioned these uh, legal rights uh, of women, and uh, I was reading in multiple places, for example, there are like so many countries still where women don't have legal rights to so many things. Even like I, I read somewhere that 18 countries, uh, you know, the women don't even have the right to go to work uh, without the permission of their husbands. And if these societal issues are uh, to remain at a ground level in so many countries, even in the 21st century. Uh, how do you think we, we change that, uh, you know, societal structure? How do we how do we bring that conversation to the table so that people actually are able to change that and, and they're allowed their legal rights like everyone else? Well, it's very complicated, obviously, and I am really not the deep expert. I sit on an organization um, called Equality Now, which is truly an extraordinary organization, and you should have Yasmin come and um, and you should interview her. Um, she is she heads up Equality Now. The the big problem in a, in a lot of these countries is that. Um, there is cultural, there's family law, and then there's obviously, you know, the, 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 the law of the land. And so often these two laws, um, the family law trumps the, 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 the laws that have been put in place by the government. And so it is really complicated, and the, and, and, and the family law is, is, is often more tribal and traditional in a sense that, you know, there's a really... Um, specific role for women and um and, and it goes into you know land ownership inheritance and everything else and so even if the um country passes laws that are different implementation of those laws if the if the law of the land is being governed by the the, the religious you know laws or family laws um it's very difficult to implement and so you know, part of it in some of these countries is cultural and cultural shifts are often the hardest things to change. And so again, go, coming back to, you know, where I started is a lot of this goes down, comes down to education. And if you are able to at least create a system where you freely are able to start educating girls in the exact same way as their male counterparts, and you have a system of education that is expansive, um, and not indoctrinating in any way that you are able to start creating um, the shift in the culture. And I personally believe we live in a time and it's going back to the using technology. Technology can be used for good and bad. I think I, we will live in a time where there are no barriers to entry to give every kid on this planet a great education. We have the ability to do it based on technology and we have the ability to um, connect some of the best teachers in the world with kids that would never normally have gotten an education. Technology can make that happen. And if we can spend billions and billions of dollars towards, um, you know, everything from our, um, you know, various priorities, especially in America that I don't agree with, um, you know, investing in our military um, establishment to the degree we do, we most certainly could find money as a global community to find a way to educate every child on this planet in a way that's meaningful. And within the cultural com constraints of, of, of any given community. And so, you know, a lot of the problems with girls is when they hit 12 or they have their period, they stop going to school. Well, there are ways to solve for that. We have technology and 
the technology can be implemented in their home or in circles of young girls. And there's so many ways we could get around these systems, these problems, but our systems are built with a pre-industrial mentality and the people that control them benefit from them. And so there's no motivation to think radically outside the box to redesign education. And I think COVID has shown those cracks and I think it's shown a lot of other things. It's forced us, I mean, the education system in America is the one thing that had not been disrupted ever. And COVID has forced some disruption because it's only because it's had to, but there's so much more that we could be doing and that we need to do. Um, and it'll be interesting to see where this all leads post COVID. Because if I look at New York City, for example, where I am based right now, and I look at this moment when it comes to education, um, you know, I had one child who was at a private school, one child was at a public school. I, my child who was at a private school, I went the other day, she's working remotely from home to pick up her supplies. She had a huge box of supplies. She had a brand new computer. She had all these amazing resources provided by the school. And then just the Sunday, there was an amazing podcast on the daily, which is a New York Times podcast, talking about the homeless kids and how right now they have no hope. They've been left out of the system because there is no way for them to be educated right now. And so COVID is in America, that's a wealthy country, has created such a crack in who can be educated and who can't be educated that it's devastating to young people across the world. And there is no reason for it. We can fix that. So all the young, young entrepreneurs who are listening in, there is a big problem for you to solve. Education is going to be a key driver to achieve all the goals. And uh, it's not just about educating girls or, uh, you know, in a particular community, but find a way to uh, innovate in education as much as you can so that we can have the larger impact uh, and, and bring everyone inclusive into the same educational ecosystem. Now, uh, since we are talking about education and you said that, of course, uh, educating girls and women is going to be, uh, should be a primary focus. Uh, now I'm going to bring a different context here and say that, uh, you know, educating men is also equally important because from the context that uh, right now, if, if it's called a man's world and if they are not taught how to empathize and how to realize that, 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 that equity, uh, then we will probably fail as much as we try to sort of, uh, you know, uplift the other parts of the education. So do you have any points on that? Then how can let, me get, let me get this straight. I'm not saying that we should educate only girls to have a, every girl on the planet should have a great education. I think every child on the planet should have a great education. And that education should include um, men and women being respectful of one another, men being respectful of women's bodies, you know, men being respectful of, and women be respectful of each other, right? And so creating um, um, part of the curriculum where it is about respect, where it is about courage, it is about empathy, it is about understanding other people from other cultures. And that because somebody says something, it doesn't mean it's literal because in their culture, it might mean something very different. We have to, as part of this commitment to educating every child and giving every child a great education, um, empathy and courage have to be front and center in that education and, and the willingness to accept divergent points of view. I sort of feel social media and the world we live in has created um, these, these, this, this bifurcation and these bubbles where we've lost the um, ability to actually even listen to each other, in, 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 listen to divergent point of views, and then respectfully disagree. Um, you know, we tend to revert to reactionary social media responses where we can hide behind the technology and not truly engage in A, listening, understanding, and then responding in a um, respectful and courageous way, even though we disagree. I think we've completely lost in the art of doing this across the board. And so I think a part of our children's education needs to start there as well. And Great. it's not it's girls, it's girls and boys equally. We, we, it's, it's important that it's, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not a, it's not a single sex option. Agreed. So, uh, you know, acceptance of divergent point of views and 
uh, empathy, this should definitely become a part of our curriculums in different parts of the world. Now, uh, let me ask uh, that, uh, you know, sort of to sum it up, uh, if we are to achieve uh, SDGs as a whole, you know, by 2030, uh, we need to empower our communities for sure, as we have done, uh, you know, in, in throughout many of your different uh, community building uh, work that you have done before. Because communities are going to be the key driver, as you said. But what would be your top three recommendations for building uh, a sustainable world with the help of uh, communities? What would that uh, blueprint look like? Yes, yeah, so my my theory of change is it's not, we need everybody. We need everybody from um, government to scientists, uh, tech, tech innovators, youth, uh, community leaders to come together in a new way and collaborate radically. A lot of times, many of our leaders lead from a place of ego or and our companies lead from a place of um, putting their brand first and not necessarily people, profit and purpose. And, um, you know, our tech entrepreneurs lead from a place of just wanting to make their, their, their the next unicorn or be as profitable as, po as possible and not necessarily thinking about, you know, the people in the planet that, that, that support and work for them. And so I, I think we need to build a new operating system. Um, you know, a lot of our world right now is being driven by Milton Friedman's doctrine that the primary responsibility of any um, um, company is to maximize for shareholder value with complete disregard for people and the planet, right? And I think we need to rebalance it. If you look at what's going on with species decline, if you look what's going on with air quality, if we don't get this right, human beings are on a path to extinction. And, and it's whether you believe in global warming or not, the fact that we're seeing such a decline in species on the planet will be to the de detriment of, of us, of humans and, and humanity. And so there are so many signals that our oceans are, are dying. There's too much plastic in our oceans and we're overfishing, but we're not listening to these signals right now, the wildfires. And so in order to fix these all complicated systems, it's not just climate change, it's not just, it's geopolitical change, it's social change, it's, um, you know, there, there, are, there are layers of um, the rate at which things are changing and, and how they're changing, how they're having a negative impact on this very small planet that we all share together. And so I think unless we think about how we come together to radically collaborate and create a different operating system, and that's not just communities, Corporations have to play their part, government have to play their part, scientists have to play their part, the young people who are listening today, who are innovators, who are starting new companies have to play their part. Um, and we have to come together to realize that we need a design for a more sustainable, more human-centered future. Otherwise, we are going to be at the mercy of um, a, a toxic environment and technology that we've designed but don't make us happy. Um, and, you know, I don't want to paint the doomsday scenario. I want to be an optimist. But what I will say at the end of the day, we are in control of designing our future and it is going to take every single one of us to make that happen. We all have a role to play. And it is overwhelming because I wake up every morning and I go, how can I, how, what can I do today that will help this process? And, um, and even working in the space I'm working in, I'm overwhelmed by it, right? And so... I think we have to think about how we design that system. And I keep going back to the drawing board. You know, TEDx was 1.0, Singularity was 2.0. You know, the Global Part of Women's March is 3.0, BOMA's 4.0. I'm working on another project right now that is um, around climate change and um, designing for an open network of networks where we can all come together in a new way to think about sustainable systems. And so I just keep going back to the drawing board and trying to create a system that could be a new operating system that would bring us together in a way that is not about ourselves and our egos, not about our brands, not about just maximizing for our shareholders, but thinking about how we want to live as human beings on the planet right now. How do I want our children to grow up? You know, a lot of the data shows that in America right now, 
a child born today is going to be far worse off than their parents were. That is new. In the 50s, if you were born in America, you knew your child was going to get a great job and be better off, right? And so, but at the end of the day, we're in control of designing the future. So let's think about how we, we, we think differently about this moment and create a global community where everybody has an education, where everybody ha can make a decent wage, and where our air is clean and our water is clean and we respect other species. It seems like a complete no-brainer to me. It is hugely complicated. But if we were all committed at least to that concept, we could start working on it. Brilliant. Such a brilliant insight that you gave us. And also it's like a blueprint that seems like if we all radically come to collaborate on with a focus on people, planet, and purpose, probably we'll be able to achieve it definitely. So at this point, I will uh, ask uh, our uh, youth representative. So Arzu is a member of our uh, youth global team at Alexis Society and Youth Forum. And she has a couple of questions for you. So Arzu, over to you. Please introduce yourself and ask the question. Hello, Lara. So my name is Arzu and I recently graduated from law school. I was really all set to launch my career into the corporate world, but my zest to work for a social issue and to impact change in the same has led me here. So I have recently joined Alexis Group as an intern to work towards better achievement and implementation of SDGs. And I have two questions for you today. So my first question for you is that uh, I feel that there are a lot of conventions, treaties, resolutions, national mechanisms, international mechanisms that are in place and they all aim at achieving sustainable development goals such as gender equality. But uh, thinking on a very individual level, on a very individualistic level as a person belonging to this century and trying to make a career in this century, in this era, I feel that it's still a mirage. Even though all these mechanisms have been put in place, I still face gender inequality at my workplace or at home or even if I step out in the market. So what do you think would be a correct approach that should be adopted in order to effect change from, very, from a very grassroots level? You mentioned that a decentralized network needs to be established. So I feel that uh, this de after the establishment of this decentralized network, that's that's actually where we need to start asking questions of Marvel importance, which are classified as uncomfortable. So how do you think we should go about it? How do you think we should, uh, how can we impact change from a very grassroots level? Yeah, so I think we're living in a very exciting time because as a young person, you do have the tools to do that, right? You do have social media, you do have convening power in a way that um, you've never had it before. And I think the change you're, you're asking for is essential to future companies being successful, future companies being competitive, and future companies designing for the future we all want to live in. And so what you're asking them to do, which is just create a fair re representation and a fair treatment of women in the environment, it should not be um, something that they have to make a choice about. It's, it's something that will make them a better company and will actually make them able to be more successful, ultimately, and profitable. And so I think in order for change to happen, some of it is top down. So some of it is getting laws passed and some of it is getting in enough women put on the board of that or your organization or any other organization, which is going to probably involve some level of government um, intervention. But it is also the bottom up. And the bottom up part takes courage because there can be consequences depending on how you use the power of the crowd to kind of make that change happen. But I will say that if you have the courage to step up and bring enough young women together that feel the way you do and create enough discomfort and noise, um, that I don't think any change will happen just from the top down. I think it has to be both top down and bottom up. And so I think you have the opportunity to use the tools at your disposal um, 
and social media to kind of, you know, create that, that tension from the bottom up. Um, and it's something that you, it's hard and you have to be courageous and you have to be a leader, but I think everybody can lead in that way. And so I think it's more a matter of you trusting in yourself and saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get 50 other women I know that are feeling the same way and let's start there and let's use convening and social media and to make our voices clear. And we've seen it, we've seen this happen, you know, um, we've seen it happen inside of organizations and we've seen it happen from the outside. Um, and when there's enough bottom up pressure that also tends to help um, shift things. But it is challenging, it takes courage and it can be dangerous depending on um, this, you know, where you live and how open the society is and how open they are to that kind of um, bottom-up power and the voice of the crowd um, trying to help shift things. And there will always be those people that are part of the old patriarchy that are going to make it very difficult because they want to hold on to their power. But really, more so than any time in history, you, you, you have access to do that. You have tools to enable you to do that. I do believe that it takes a lot of courage to actually stand up and voice an opinion that is going to make a change in the society. And I also believe that where there is a will, there is a way. So uh, I'd like to ask you one more question. And that's, uh, can you tell me three things or actions that young individuals like me can take uh, to contribute towards the goal that you are trying to achieve through BOMA. And as a young global individual who is passionate about these issues, what is it that we can do to contribute to, to the bigger picture that you are trying to see? So yes, um, with BOMA, we have um, a community offering called BOMA Circles, where we are looking for social impact and innovation that, that, that is actually action focused. Um, and we have different um, designs to these circles. So anybody can sign up to join a BOMA Circle if you go to the BOMA website or create a BOMA Circle. And so that's one way. We also have a, this new initiative that we're launching as a consortium, a network of networks, where we would like everybody to be involved. We haven't announced it yet, so um, there will be a way for everybody to be to get involved in that, and that's very much focused on um, social justice and um, and and building a more sustainable future. And um, you know, I, I think. Empowering the crowd is um, definitely at the heart of, of everything I, I do and, and that I believe in. And so um, my whole role is to create systems where we can all engage together to find a way to design a better future. And so, you know, I don't have all the solutions, but I'm always also open to young people helping me do it because I, th I believe that the future of this new operating system isn't necessarily going to be designed by me. It's going to be designed by you and your friends and the young people out there that understand that this, you know, old command and control system that we've created of, you know, that isn't diverse, that has, you know, um, you know, one voice that often moves very slowly in, in the way it makes decisions um, is not working for for, the, for, you, for young people or the planet. And so it's really going to be up to all of us to figure out, especially young people, how we re redesign this, the operating system for multiple inputs and for agility. Thank you so much, Lara, for such an engaging and insightful conversation. And thank you, Arju, for your questions. Now, uh, to sum it up, uh, as you rightfully said, we are in control of the future that we want to create. And, as, and, and for all the things that you said, what hit me the most is let us all come together to create a new operating system for the world where human will is channelized for people, planet, and purpose. But before I conclude the session, I have one more question left for you. That is... Uh, if I am to ask you to sum up your vision for a better world 
in one sentence, what would that be? One sentence. A global community where everybody has an ability to input and design their the future they want. That is a future of inclusivity, respect, and sustainability for all people, planet, and other creatures. How's that for one sentence? <laughs> Thank you so much. And on that note, once again, thank you very much for joining us and giving us your time. And everyone who is listening in and joining us for this session, for a world where no one is left behind, it has never been clearer that all of us have a role to play in order to bring about change. Whoever you are, no matter where you come from, every one of us can make a difference. Every action truly counts. Get involved. Attend the SDG Action Conclave 2020, participate in the SDG quiz, help raise awareness about the goals, and connect with a global community of passionate volunteers. The global, this Global Goals Week, let us all come together to spread the knowledge about people, planet, and our sustainable development goals. Thank you all for joining us. Follow us on Instagram at Youth Forum India for all the updates. And don't forget to join our next session.